Hi everyone and welcome to episode three of IAM's podcast on navigating hybrid working. Um, this episode is going to focus on technology, both how to use it successfully in a hybrid working environment and some of the kind of considerations around um, how it can be a hindrance and some of the, the pitfalls of using it. Um, so if we kick things off with you, Phil, in terms of your perspective on a full rollout of digital transformation, make everything digi digital, eradicate face-to-face, -face, problem solved. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's an interesting topic that, and I guess it's easy to think um, from everything that's happened that digital is the be-all and end-all solution. Um, and if you look at kind of what we've had over the last 18 months or so, you could argue that it is the correct solution. If nobody ever went into into the office again, then digital has to be the only solution. Uh, but where people are kind of going back to the office or being hybrid or, or being solely remote, I think there's always going to be a place for um, a blend of, of all the solutions, really, still face to face, resources, knowledge bases, courses. Um, and it. I guess the key thing is not kind of trying to follow the trend. Um, I think it would be very easy for one to say, oh, everyone's moving over into 90% digital and they never do any face-to-face -face training anymore or, or very little. And because everybody else is doing that, I need to do that or my business needs to do that as well. I think we still need to keep that right back to basics of a uh, training needs analysis and saying what is the best solution for the end result that we need to actually get. Um, one of the big debates at the moment is obviously resources versus courses. Um, I still think there's a place for both, of course. Um, sometimes you need a more hefty course, sometimes you need a resource. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, for me, it's always going to be digital enhances an experience and it's utilized in the right way. That's what makes technology a good solution, not just following the trend. I just want to dive in there, actually, the um, resources versus courses conversation. Um, this has come up a lot recently. Um, I know lots of us have posted about it on, on social media. We discussed it in other places. And I think the biggest thing with that is when you look at where it came from, uh, the excellent book by Nick, uh, Nick Shackleton-Jones about how people learn and people pulled from it res uh, resources, not courses. But that's not what he said. What he said was, courses are great for developing long-term understanding and preparing you for future events. Resources are great if you need to do something right now. The argument was never and should never be one or the other. It's all about using the right solution to get the results that you want. Um, so I think you're spot on there with the starting with a needs analysis. Um, kind of, it, it dispels that as even being a debate because the right solution is just the one you should go with, regardless of whether it's course, resource, comms, digital, face-to-face, -face, mix of all of the above. So looking at it from the right solution perspective, what do we think are some of the things that digital can contribute and what does it fail to replicate? I guess it, uh, to, to me, it depends on, a, what experience you want to create for your people. I think that's still a big part of it. Um, you know, if your values are about being a people business, I think that still needs to drive your learning solution as well. Um, there's still ways that you can convey that in a, in a digital medium, of course, um, being kind of a people company. But you, you, there is that argument to say, well, let's create a solution. Yes, that's right for the the, the, the outcome, but also that represents our company values as well um and again it depends on the overall solution i think so for example simulations are always a, a a big debate about whether they're useful or not useful you know system simulations and they do have a place i think um are they the sole best way to potentially do a simulation uh, to, to train out systems? Probably not, because it fragments a learning experience sometimes where you're learning a system. Then later on, you learn the policy in a different course and you don't get that kind of connection between ask X question at this part of the process. But a simulation can be useful for uh, post-training and kind of that 
um, you know, I've forgotten how to do X process. Let me go on and complete this simulation to refresh myself. But the main process is learned potentially in the training room. So I, I think it's very hard to say that any particular um, type of content is better suited to digital. And it's about looking at the overall solution. Never look at something as an individual solution. I think somebody goes, oh, we have this issue, so therefore we create this course. And before you know it, you've created 100 courses on multiple different things and they never link up. You always need to step back and say, well, how does this fit into the bigger picture? And is there actually something else that we've already created or already doing that actually we can just enhance that particular piece of learning rather than create something completely new? Yeah, I, th I think I'd I'd mostly agree is that the the content weirdly doesn't necessarily drive particularly digital or face to face solution. Um, and I, I kind of this kind of got reinforced to me this week, actually. I've been a fairly long term and vocal um, thorn in the side of VR in the L&D space in that it's not good enough and it's not really that effective. Um, but just this week, actually, I experienced some excellent VR training. Um, that was all to do with mental health. Um, it's very, very clever, very well made. It's a topic that historically I would probably have said you need to get people together to discuss, to really make an impact because it's human, right? It, it's a highly personal topic. But actually, I think that's probably the most effective um, sort of bit of um, uh, kind of walk in the shoes of training that I've ever I've ever seen done. Uh, obviously highly specialist and d could only be done in a digital world. But um, historically, I think it's a topic we would have said, oh, you get them in a room and you talk about that kind of thing. Um, so I think it's far less content driven and much more about the actual quality of what you produce. You've got historically digital content has been ah, make it a PowerPoint slide and put some next buttons in. Uh, and we always talk about this is that, you know, Digital is not all, it's not an equal playing field. There are different levels of quality, different levels of design and visual quality, different levels of uh, learning design quality. And I think that's actually got far more to do with what works digitally and what works face to face, uh, as opposed to just the content. Yeah, and just to build on that as well, I think we always need to go back to the, the kind of that first question of what does somebody actually need to be able to do or do differently? And if you can't, create that experience in a face-to-face -face or digital format whatever that might be then to, to still go for that solution is always going to be the wrong solution you know there is always that kind of reactive uh, part to being in the in the L&D space uh, especially in internal teams where an x issue comes up the director says we need to solve this problem and suddenly you have to jump on it and solve that problem um, and often the solution to that is, well, let's do something digital because it's cost effective. It's easy to schedule people in and it's it's quick to get out there and, and train all of our staff. But if that's not the right solution, there still needs to be that consideration to say what's the right thing for the people and what's the right thing for the business as well. Um, and, and that flips itself on its head as well. Sometimes people will ask the, an L&D team for what is the right solution and we'll go, well, let's do it digital and we can do this big game and we can do all of this stuff, big fiasco stuff off the back of it because that's what our people want. We need to engage them. But sometimes there does need to be that place to say, absolutely, um, you know, people need to be a consideration in a learning solution. But if a the business still needs to be a consideration there as well. So sometimes almost quick and dirty does need to be the solution if that outweighs the cost of doing something a longer term in regards to like the volume of complaints, for example. That, that's always a key driver to, to training. So I think technology, there's always a time and a place to go big and bold and there's always a, a right time to go face to face versus digital. But it's about assessing here and now what your business is and what the problem is and what you need to get out of the back of it let that drive it all the time no matter hybrid or not hybrid that should have always been the case and how much do you think we should be taking note of the technology that people are using in their personal lives and how they're learning socially and, and is there a value in us starting to you know try and jump on board with some of that with workplace learning I, mean, I think I would say for sure. I mean, I think there's a reason why, 
you see an increased amount of posts around how can L and D use TikTok, for example. You know, I, I guess you know there is definitely some crossover. I think it's finding the right vehicles for these things, isn't it? But I think I don't know the general. My sort of personal view, probably on this, is that these things are a little bit cyclical. But I think certainly, um, if a few years ago, or you know, kind of, I think micro learning and kind of short courses content was actually a bit of a dirty word. But I think um, it's kind of come back very into very much on trend and that kind of sort of short bite sized content. You know, and you just look at the way the majority of people learn these days and, it, and, it's, you know, and this whole generational thing is probably, you know, rubbish really. Actually, you know, I know if I, I was doing something the other day and I couldn't work out how to do it, so I went onto YouTube and watched a 60-second 60, 60, 60 video, you know. Um, and I think it, there, there is definite lessons to be learnt from that crossover between those worlds. Yeah, I, I think... I, I think I kind of agree. Uh, I think we maybe pay slightly too much attention to it at times, though. And I think the biggest way you see that is with the kind of 2018 to 2020, everything's going to go mobile. And then it didn't because no one wants to use their mobile phone for their job unless their work is providing them a mobile phone. And that's perfectly reasonable. Why should I give my personal mobile phone to the business to load up learning on it. That's my phone, not theirs. If they want me to use a mobile phone, they can give me one. If they don't, I'll use the equipment they have given me. And I feel like that's an example of where L&D kind of got a bit ahead of what was actually going to happen because it looked at social learning, which is a great place to look and it's where we see things like YouTube and as you say, TikTok. And I think they're fantastic examples of platforms that we can mirror, we can benefit from, we can imitate. But assuming that everything's going to go mobile and then it didn't meant a lot of businesses invested a lot of money in mobile first approaches and all these things that then proved to just kind of be a waste of time and money because that jump was never going to happen. And anyone with a little bit of sense would have gone, hang on, shall we ask people if they want to use their mobile phones? No, we'll just assume that they use them at home and therefore they will use them at work. And we never quite thought about the difference between home and work, which almost sounds strange when we say it out loud. Yeah, and it's still a place for mobile learning, of course, yeah. isn't there? So you always want to have that mobile first approach still in your design, because obviously there might be somebody who does eventually complete it on their mobile phone. But if you know, if you look at the, the stats out there, the majority of people that complete a piece of e-learning or, or digital learning on their phone are, are very small. They use it again more for those kind of quick resources because um, yes. it's easy accessible, like like YouTube, for example, or a quick Google search, whatever it might be. But people don't really want to be sat there for probably 15 minutes unless they have to because they're out in the field and that's their only device that they can maybe um, that they have. Yeah. Um, then really, most people will still use a, a tablet, laptop, or or PC because that's what they tend to work on anyway. Um, I guess taking a more strategic view to to kind of the, the social learning aspect. I think from my point of view, having spent years having to report on data and, and, and stuff like that, I guess another consideration that you do need to utilize uh, or think about, sorry, when, when using social media and things like YouTube and stuff like that is what needs to be tracked and what doesn't need to be tracked. Um, obviously, the the reason for an LMS historically has basically been to almost say, well, this person has done X course on X date and they've completed or not completed. Realistically, do you need to see if somebody's done this motivational video on, on a TED talk or YouTube? Uh, have they researched customer service skills at, 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 on Google? Do you need to see that? That's a decision for you as a business. And again, that dr drives your solution and what you promote and what you don't promote. Because if you want visibility, or shall I say, so you need visibility of that. There's a very difference between want and need. Let's just clarify that. If you need visibility that people have completed these more social aspects to their learning, then probably look to get your own internal resource or course uh, available to those people. If you don't need to track it, utilize them. Absolutely promote them. Of course, there's a consider IT consideration, of course. Um, a lot of companies do have things like TikTok, YouTube and stuff blocked as a, as a site. So there's a bit of trust there as well in your people in saying, well, if we unlock these, we need to trust that you're using it as a, 
a learning resource and in the right way you're not sat there watching youtube videos of cats between between your job go um, to <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing right now, Phil. I'm doing right now. I feel like we're all minimising windows as Phil's yeah, speaking here. Yeah. Oh, no. The oh, cats no. are so cute, though. Yeah. Oh, but let's not deny it. You know, YouTube is a very powerful learning tool. Um, mm. you know, I've probably used it about three or four times myself this, you know, in the last couple of days alone, um, especially for software. Adobe is a classic one. You know, you can use Adobe for years and there's still something you go, no idea how to do that because adobe is such powerful tools the first place you go is youtube of course it is um it wouldn't necessarily be the first place you'd go though of course if you're in a particular job trying to do a process because it, if that's on youtube well i think you've got some bigger issues in your company as to why your processes are on youtube uh, so there is a time and a place for it. it's a powerful tool and we don't always have the time a resource to build these uh, kind of courses or resources in your business. Excel is a prime example where a lot of people will say we need an Excel course program catalog uh, because we use Excel. People need to know how to use it. So therefore, they spend months creating these courses when actually all of that is available for people on tap on YouTube. And if anything, they'll probably still go to there rather than doing your course on the LMS. Do you think sort of on that note that causation is harder than ever to to pin down because people are learning so much socially and outside of work and through the for all these programs that the organization doesn't have oversight of so are we getting less confident in being able to say no it was the internal training that's resulted in this you know great improvement because we just don't know what else people are accessing I think if anyone ever had total confidence in that, it was false confidence and they, they should be glad to be rid of it. Um, Cause I, I, th I think it's one of the, the big sins that perhaps a, much of the industry, certainly myself has been guilty of in the past of going correlation equals causation. We did this training, things got better, training worked. Did it? Are you sure? Did nothing else happen in that time? Um, did a manager do some coaching? Was there were there performance updates? Was there a system change? Has the time of year altered the customer base or what they're called? You know, there's so many variables going on in most businesses at any given time. I don't actually think it's that much l more difficult now to prove causation. I think it's always been exceptionally difficult to prove um, the with any absolute certainty the effectiveness of training. Um, you, you, you can set metrics, um, but you have to kind of allow for the fact that other stuff is going to happen as well as your training, whether you like it or not. You can't kind of sterilize the work environment to the point where the only uh, the only stimulus people are receiving is your training. And the, the flip side to that, of course, is when people use the argument that training didn't work. So you, you, you track the, the metrics off the back of doing X intervention or or, or whatever it might be, you see that your your data and KPIs improve off the back of that for two or three months, and then suddenly it dips down, and people go, well, training wasn't effective. Um, but behind the scenes, of course, if those skills aren't coached, if learning and coaching, sorry, training and coaching aren't aligned and working together, then those skills don't get embedded, they don't sustain, so therefore, of course, they, they, they peter off if they're not used. But it's very dependent on whether people have or haven't used those skills in that time frame. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm in agreement. It's a very hard thing to pinpoint specifically that your intervention has improved X metrics, so therefore you've saved Y money. Um, there's always going to be a place for it, of course. We, uh, one of the biggest things we always have to do is justify uh, as, as L&D teams are what we're doing and, and our value, because often we're the first people to get cut whenever there's a new OD or, or money needs to be saved. So if you, the more you can try and prove your worth, of course, the better. Um, and I think yeah. then it becomes about how you prove that. And rather than trying to prove it with absolute statements of this happened and we 100 percent caused it, it's more about demonstrating your involvement in key performance increases in the business or compliance. You know, if you aren't being sued because you haven't breached GDPR or whatever you, it might be that you could have been sued for, that 
that's clearly a demonstration that at some level the training is working. Um, it's one of those, it's never going to make you money. It just means nothing happens. Uh, when that's the best scenario and that is happening, the training is being proven effective. It just doesn't always feel like it. There's an education piece here as well, I think, isn't it? Because a lot of what you're talking about here as well, I guess, as, as is all training, ultimately, it kind of introduces the behaviours or the change that you want to engender. And I think ultimately culture isn't just going to suddenly miraculously shift you know, in fact, culture can, you know, well, it's probably quite quick to break down, but it will certainly take you a lot longer to hit that kind of cultural high note. So mm. I guess, you know, yes, it's obviously like we've been discussing valid to track and to to see what, whether your interventions are heading you in the right direction. You, you know, you can track that through your, probably your normal business KPIs almost, but, but ultimately you kind of need to be in this for the longer term and recognise that all these things are hopefully going to combine to take you to where you want to be culturally. Yeah. Yeah. So if we shift focus a little bit and, and move on to the sort of accessibility conversation around digital, you know, what do you guys, I think, think of some of the kind of key concerns around that and how do we make sure that we're not isolating people and just providing for the tech savvy? Um, so, I mean, I guess there's two conversations there. There's the quote unquote tech savvy and there's accessibility. Um, uh, technically they're the same topic but I think there's, there's there's two different groups of issues there's the I don't like using computers and refuse to develop those skills at which point my belief is actually that businesses should say well look you, you now live in a digital world I appreciate it may not always have been that way we're going to support you in learning it but we're not going to create a non-digital option just for you because um, I don't think that is the right solution because um, where do you stop with that that means potentially you've got two versions of everything. Um, you would never go, okay, well, you don't like using technology, so you don't have to use the internal computer systems. You can print everything off and work on paper. Um, that's obviously the extreme end of that conversation. But, you know, I, I think training should apply that kind, of, that kind of thought and say the solution is not to not go digital because some people go, oh, a computer, I don't know. It's to encourage those people to engage with that um kind of digital world it will help them outside of work as well I guarantee you they've got a phone and a facebook account if they can do that i'm pretty sure they can log into an lms there it's far simpler let's be honest um the accessibility side i think is far more on the sort of l and d design world and there's been a big shift over the last year um certainly in the uk where it's not a legal requirement yet but i think it is definitely an ethical and moral requirement on anyone creating content um, and we see that championed by people like susie miller all around the country um really just to abide by simple kind of what called the wacag standards that apply to all websites anyway um and just thinking about basic stuff like closed captions and transcripts and naming things and providing alternative text that you know, we, we all spend a lot of time making sure it's embedded in every single step of our content. Um, and it doesn't take much work. And I think that's why when people sort of say, oh, I don't want to do accessibility because it's more work. I don't want to do accessibility because it kills courses and this kind of thing. It, it doesn't have to. It doesn't need to. It just needs to be applied in a sensible way. Um, so I don't think that and the technology is there now to mean that everyone can access um, sort of digital content. So it really doesn't need to be a barrier as it might have been five, 10 years ago. Do you think it's it's basically we're at a point where we just need to be designing that as a default? So rather than, you know, because I've, I've seen some articles around how do you encourage staff to have honest conversations about their accessibility needs and their disabilities and, and, and make a culture which allows for those conversations. But I guess part of that is, or one approach to that, is just that you design for everyone to accommodate everyone from the off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think, think so. Go on, Phil. Good, Phil. I was just going to say that, you know, a lot of workplaces are potentially gone where we don't have a large um, kind of... Uh, workforce that with disabilities that have been been claimed um but it's not just necessarily that there's a lot of people potentially that are dyslexic and, and maybe never been diagnosed with it um you know you just need to look at my spelling to probably say actually um, it's probably you know at 32 years of age and i still can't spell very well probably i've got a, a degree of dyslexia there that i've never bothered to to check out um 
but also it's environmental kind of situational sometimes um, so a busy workforce if you're working in a call center and you have nowhere to go and do your your e-learning well trying to listen to some audio or watch a video it can be really hard no matter what headphones you you've got unless they're noise cancelling which often are provided by uh, companies having some closed captions there just to to help with that kind of environmental noisy environment can, can really help um, and you know you might break your arm and then you can't use your mouse so suddenly you need to resort to um, maybe trying to to control the e-learning via your, your your keyboard so it's not just about disabilities it's also about what enhances that experience just to make it a bit easier for, for people when they want it really yeah yeah that was exactly my point really that i think when we think about learning content we designed i, I would say that a lot of it we, we did just because we thought it was best practice not necessarily because it was for accessibility um, you know, I mean, I can think of plenty of examples even now, actually, where we talk to, you know, different people. And I'm still always surprised when people say to me, do we have to use voiceover as in our computers don't have audio? Um, you know, so, you know, the, the IT estate that's out there is so varied even today, you know, you know, organizationally, you know, people are still catching up on that front. But you know, we just, have, you know, felt that you, know, you, you, do, you do these things because people like to to consume content in different ways. It's more about the learner experience than anything else. You know, we, we, we add a podcast into the content, which isn't really a podcast. It's like the, the voiceover and MP4 format. But we get a lot of feedback from people that say, I just love it because I can download that and I just like stick my earbuds in and I listen to it. Um, and it's not for any particular accessibility reason, but you, don't, you almost don't know how this content gets used, but it's the right thing to do because it satisfies a lot of different, you know, learner um, uh, desires, I guess. Yeah. How about um, kind of issues with digital fatigue in terms of how do we spot the signs that, you know, people are getting overloaded with, you know, face to face meetings, always being on camera, um, that they're they're lacking maybe kind of that or feeling overwhelmed by that reliance on technology? And what do we do about that? I guess question. One, one, one simple way is just ask people, you know, if, if if people are getting fed up with Zoom meetings or whatever it might be, then, you you know, if you've got a, an open and honest culture, you would hope that somebody would raise that with their boss. Um, I, I guess you do, you know, tech, Zoom is a great example where people still hate it. Um, but there is a, a great need for it uh, and there's a great place for it. Um, I know there's certainly meetings with either clients or even internally when we're discussing stuff where just having that camera and being able to see somebody does it's surprising how much of a difference it does actually make um and plus you, you, a it forces people to actually pay a bit more attention as well i know it sounds silly but when you're when you're on a phone call and somebody can't see you it's very easy to either do this email or do this quick reply or actually pay no attention whatsoever um if you know that X person is quite a, a talker and they're, and they're having their little piece in their meeting. So I think just that, that camera piece does does add a bit of interaction. Um, but yeah, you just got to ask people, I think, you know, get the feedback. If it's not working, is there a different way that, that can be done and, and change your approaches? Not everything is, we're not going to get everything right straight away. Um, and we still need to keep going. Well, we've tried this. How's that going? Engage with your people utilize surveys and ominous surveys and stuff like that how are you finding it if you don't like it why don't you like it make sure you get that why you know just make sure it's not personal preference over uh accessibility or it just doesn't work because my wi-fi is rubbish at home whatever it might be um so yeah just, just ask people we're too scared to sometimes just ask people outright just to say do you like this or not is it it's like when um so years ago when when um with one of my leaders it's the same with um coaching what, what does the name we've got all these models around coaching theories and how to coach different people and social styles styles and myers-briggs and all this stuff but nobody actually just thinks to go 
well, why don't I just ask you how you like to be coached and managed and, and get it from the source rather than trying to guess and put them into your model and then theorize and then use your NLP skills to, to coach them in a certain way. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, conversation is more powerful than a, than a model or guessing ever will be. Totally agree. I think more practically, I was just saying, sorry, Tom, three. Um, I was just saying, I suppose more practically, I think certainly seen a lot more of late where, you know, I don't know, give it, making sure that you don't book Zoom calls between 12 and 1, you know, kind of let people have the natural time to break. I mean, we use HubSpot as our CRM. They've, they've got a well-being week this week where they basically kind of give everybody, pretty much everybody in the organization the week off and they've kind of implemented processes. Obviously, they still kind of maintain that core tech support but they're sort of saying hey look just for this week talk to your account manager before they go if you're renewing this week do it before this week you know if you've got a bill coming up you know if you need it delaying let us know the week before um we've got our help pages if you need us you know anything urgent of course we'll deal with it here's the dedicated mailbox someone will monitor this you know you're seeing that increasing i think so i think there's lots of practical steps i think you can take to help break some of that tech sort of vicious cycle that you get into so sorry tom the other tom was interrupted you there i was just gonna say one of the elements of fatigue we often forget about then is actually that it's not zoom or google chat or what you're doing it's how you're doing it it's bad facilitation especially in the learning world when everything first jumped onto Zoom, you just got a trainer sat there for three hours going, and here is the content, and I'm going to talk to you, and you're going to answer questions, and so on and so forth. And if they were really stretching it, they might use the chat. Ooh. Um, it was a bit like going back to MSN Messenger days, for those of us that remember MSN Messenger. And ran to school to talk to the same people you were sat with like 20 minutes ago all evening. Um what we did it's how you pass the time before netflix was invented uh, <laughs> but after the home phone was kind of obsolete that was the important thing um but we don't live in that world anymore we live in the world where you can have breakout rooms and polls and interactions in your zoom call or you can use teams to split people off into completely separate calls to go and do activities and come back you can replicate far more of those interactive elements that we would typically say was face-to-face -face training than we used to be able to on digital platforms. But very, very few of the sort of digitally facilitated sessions, be them L&D or be them general meetings, use that functionality. And when we talk about fatigue and someone says, oh, it's another same old one hour Zoom call, sit here, listen, turn off. Well, it's no wonder they're fatigued. You're using 5% of what the software can do. Uh, and all that extra stuff has been added to help you engage and excite your audience. Um, so kind of what do you expect to an extent if you refuse mm. to use that functionality? Um, if you've got the software, you're paying for it. It's a bit like buying like a, I don't know, a fast car. I don't drive uh, and never going above 30. Um, why not use what it can do to help prevent or at least stave off um, that kind of boredom that you get with some digital content? Um, you can do a lot more if they're actually interacting with it rather than just passively sat there going, great. Yeah, well, and if you consider the, uh, the amount of time as well that people actually in their day-to-day -day life spend on technology, yeah. then all of a sudden you get into your work environment and you can't stand using technology then you need to ask yourself, what? why is that? Um, you know, yes, people go, oh, well, I'm stuck on a Zoom call for one hour, whatever it might be. But I'd certainly rather be doing that than being back in the office, stuck in back-to-back -back meetings. You know, I've been in that scenario where your entire day is back-to-back -back meetings, meetings about the meeting you've just been in, and then a meeting to prep for the next meeting. Mm. So, you know, you, you could argue that actually it's a bit more efficient uh, using this technology. People are used to it. Um, so if somebody can sit there for an hour scrolling on social media, but they can't stand being on your Zoom call for 15 minutes, like what you're saying, Tom, three, you've got to look at the facilitation and how you're using those tools rather than saying, well, this isn't necessarily right um, for our workplace. And we've all just on that. Sorry, before we move on, I can see you've got the move on face about to come on, Gemma. But it's, it's a just classic thing. move on face. <laughs> but I was just going to say as well, we have to remember that the last kind of year and a half is not a good measure of this because the last year and a half has not been. Let's do hybrid working because it's the right thing to do. It's been 
oh, everyone go home. Go home now. We'll figure it out as we go. Don't go outside. You might die. It's this this kind of... This has not been a good measure of how to create really great digital content. This has been a measure of how quickly can businesses adapt to something they were completely unprepared for. Uh, And when we talk about people being, oh, they're not willing to sit there for this. Well, a lot of people have gone from being potentially very relaxed people, what they were normal people, to being very anxious people or people in situations that they don't know how to handle. Um, So I think a lot of what we hear at the minute is probably not the best measure of what the what the real long term uh, view will be of being at home and doing digital and using Zoom. What, what about fatigue in terms of ability to switch off? So we've introduced, you know, we've got this real reliance now, which is probably here to stay with things like Teams and Slack. A lot of people have those apps on their personal phone. You know, people are chatting well into the evening and the weekend. How, you know, I appreciate, you know, a lot of it is, will you set the culture as, as the leadership team of what's okay and what's not? But some people like that. For some people, that's part of their social connection and they like the flexibility of being able to jump in, you know, when suits them. So how do we get that balance right? I, th- I think we just need to be, it's going to be a learning curve. It certainly is. Um, I, I think, like you said, yes, it's more than culture, but it starts from that leadership and down really and, and then making sure that it's acceptable for you to not feel obliged to reply. Um, the, the joy of hybrid working, of course, is um, and, and even remote working is that you can flex your hours that that little bit more. So if you want to do 10 six, you, you, you almost can. You know, we, we spoke about that in one of the previous podcasts, that it's more about output than than kind of clocking in and clocking out just because you're there between nine and five doesn't mean you're productive. If I'm more productive because uh, between the hours of 12 and eight and that doesn't impact the work, then allow people to do that. So it's recognizing that people might be working different hours. You need to make your own personal choice with that work-life balance and saying, do I or don't I want these apps on my device? And if I do need them on my device, um, so I'm, you know, I'm a prime example where uh, we use Slack. I have it on my phone. Uh, I have that on my phone. I don't really know why anymore because <laughs> I never really use it. It's more of a backup. But if I'm popping out to the the, the shops or something like that, I, it's more peace of mind for me knowing that I'm not missing maybe something an urgent message. But I do have a, a setting on there that after six o'clock, it doesn't notify me of any messages. So if I do check it it's out of my choice to do so rather than uh, kind of that notification pinging up and and feeling obliged or kind of having that inquisitiveness about your behavior and going, I need to see what that message is. Is it important? Because you can only see the first two lines. Uh, and then you kind of sit there until 11 o'clock at night, scratching your head going, I wonder if I'm getting fired tomorrow. Uh, or maybe it was just something really simple. Um, yeah. The, yeah. Is that one of the the dangers of the flexibility of hours where you feel like if you don't reply at seven, you can miss out on an important conversation or you hold something up? You know, if we're all working at different times on this 24-7 tech, that's a bit of a risk, isn't it? Or or that some people may feel a pressure that they, they must engage at the point where everyone else is chatting or fall behind. I think there's two sides to that. I think if your workforce is so dispersed that the hours they're working are preventing the job being done, that's mismanagement. And so Mm -hmm. it's a slightly different conversation because I don't think anyone would argue that everyone should just be able to work whenever they fancy it. Um, You know, everything should be in the frame of assuming it works for you and the business. Um, Because otherwise you could go, okay, I'm going to work from one in the morning until, you know, whenever that might lead you up to however long your working day is going to be, and you're the only person working then. Um, So there are some sort of sensible limitations that to an extent prevent that. But I think there is a massive responsibility that businesses, uh, I think perhaps a lot think they live up to it, but maybe fall slightly short of the mark in this world we're talking about when it comes to things like people with anxiety disorders or people who worry beyond the, oh, well, don't worry about it response or just leave it you can get that message tomorrow for some of us we'll kind of go "Mm, yeah it'll irk me but never mind it's fine there are people who can't that that's just not how it works for them um and i think they're the the 
the solution is very simply that managers need to speak to their people. They need to make sure they're regularly in contact with them. Being digital, being remote does not mean you don't need to speak to them every day. Um, it doesn't mean you don't ever meet up. It doesn't mean you don't have phone calls just because you've got Zoom as well. Um, a prime example being some people don't want to discuss something on camera, but they might discuss it on the phone. They might discuss it by email. It's keeping those open lines of communication. And when you know something isn't right, doing something about it, not just saying, oh, well, if there's a problem, they'll tell me. Well, no, they won't, because that's what the problem is. Um, and that's but and we but we see it all the time, right? And people end up six feet under before they go, there's a problem over here. Um, and then everything's been dropped. Um, and so managers actually now need to be more proactive than ever because they can no longer see the person sat at the desk getting worried or upset. So they need to have those conversations more regularly and be a bit more direct in there. Not just you're right, but actually getting to that next level of, look, I've noticed that X, Y and Z. What, what's going on um, and what do you need from me? How can I fix it rather than relying on people to come forward? Yeah. So how how do organisations take all of this in and decide what digital tech is right for them and their people? Is it an LMS? Is it an LXP? You know, do we use Slack? Are, are there aspects of Teams? You know, what are kind of the key things that the conversations they need to be having to think about this? I can start by uh, oh, go on, Tom. I was just going to say start with what do you already have in house. Um, is the most always any question really is what have you already got? Um, especially these days for most businesses, you've got Microsoft. Chances are everything runs Windows in-house, more or less, bar the sort of few businesses that base everything on Macs. Um, and if you've got Windows and your business, chances are you've got Office. Well, that means you've got the full Office suite, you've got Teams, you've got to do, you've got pretty much everything you want already on your doorstep. So before you start looking at shiny stuff that's advertised look at what you've already got in house look at what your it team has already got inside the infrastructure uh, i think that's where a lot of mistakes creep in when people immediately jump to the most popular or the shiniest new solution rather than looking at what they've already got yeah very similarly i, I, I guess my was a slightly different starting point but get very similar uh, kind of process i'll say start with what you need to be able to do um, and then map what you have already that does that job. Um, similar principle, don't bring something in and disperse everything just because this product does this need and this does that need. Figure out everything you need to be able to do and why you need to be able to do it. Look at what technology you've got. Does that do the job? If it does, is it the best way of doing that job? So yes, uh, use existing tech if it's working and it's doing the right thing. If, if it's not, is there a system that can combine it or another system that you've already got that you could be utilizing all of these particular needs into one particular system? Um, so yeah, that, 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 that would be my starting point. Always start with the need and why. Yeah, the danger of overcomplicating it and we've got loads of different technology in play and no one knows where to go for anything. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think I guess as well, you know, I always think was it sort of, people change delivered through processes enabled by technology, you know, so as a kind of sort of sort of way of cementing it. So in other words, I guess people might be tempted to jump straight to that technology piece right early on, but that's probably the last place to begin, you know, and it really is, you know, ultimately I think most of this should really be people transformation and people change, which also means you need to look at your processes and then probably your data as well. And then, and then think about, well, what's the stack? Cause these guys have been saying, you know, and then what have you got? What do you need to add to? And how do you continue to make sure that all builds together? Because I've also seen plenty of IT technology stacks that are really, really dis disparate and therefore, you know, they really struggle and ultimately you want it to be integrated to probably be cost effective, but also to have any chance of really being used and embedded in the organization. Feels like a nice bit of wisdom to finish up on, Tom. Thank you for that. Um, so next time we'll be moving on to episode four and focusing on leadership in the hybrid working space. So we'll be exploring things like uh, trust, which keeps coming up a lot. Um, and, you know, having that trust in people 
Um, and also upskilling our leaders, you know, are there new areas around well-being, around performance management when you're not together? You know, how do we get people, in a, uh, managers especially, in a position where they feel confident and competent to deliver that? 